for coming today. I'm attorney Gloria Allred. And to my right is Elizabeth. That's not her real name, but that's the name she's using today. And next to her is Charlotte, and then there is Sarita. And they will be making a statement after I make a statement. They will not be answering questions, however, I will be happy to take questions. Today, I'm here with two new accusers of Bill Cosby, and with one additional accuser who has previously spoken about, now about what she alleges that Mr. Cosby did to her, but who wanted to be here today to support the new accusers. They are speaking out now because they want the world to know what they alleged that they were forced to suffer because they had the misfortune to meet a man that they admired and thought that they could trust, Bill Cosby. Charlotte Fox was a 23-year-old aspiring actress when she came into contact with Bill Cosby. Elizabeth was only 20 years old when she had the bad luck to be serving as a flight attendant on the American Airlines flight on which Mr. Cosby was flying from the east to the west coast. Sarita Butterfield, who was here with us and has spoken out previously, was a model for Playboy magazine when Mr. Cosby contacted her. For all of these women, meeting Mr. Cosby was viewed at first as exciting because he was a major celebrity. Quickly, however, in the opinion of these women, their encounters with him became a negative and life-changing experience. Although all of them kept the secret from the public of what they alleged happened to them for many years, they have now decided to come forward in an, in an effort to help other women and hold Mr. Cosby accountable for what they allege was his misconduct with them. Although it is too late for them to take any legal action, because of the statute of limitations. It is not too late for them to become empowered women who can speak out in the court of public opinion. And that is what they are doing today. For at least one of the many accusers of Mr. Cosby, however, it is not too late for her to pursue a lawsuit against Mr. Cosby. Judy Koch has filed a lawsuit against Mr. Cosby and she alleges that she was only 15 years old when she became a victim of sexual conduct by him at the Playboy Mansion in Beverly Hills. I represent her in this case. Mr. Cosby has been ordered to appear for his deposition in Ms. Huff's lawsuit on October 9, 2015. At his deposition, Mr. Cosby will have an opportunity to provide an account of what he says happened in his encounter with my client, Judy Huff. After his long period of public silence, we would hope that he would welcome this opportunity to testify fully and completely and give his side of the story. As is true in any deposition of any party into a lawsuit, we expect to hear answers to our questions directly from Mr. Cosby who will not be able to hide behind his attorneys and his apologists, and they will not be able to answer the questions for him. We intend to ask questions that are relevant to Judy's lawsuit, and questions that may tend to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence in her case. We expect to take the deposition of Bill Cosby, not the friendly father figure of his television character, Dr. Huxtable. We want the real Bill Cosby to show up, not Dr. Huxtable. And we expect Mr. Cosby will answer our questions fully and completely. Mr. Cosby now has to deal with reality. Although we will be videotaping Mr. Cosby's deposition, this is not a sitcom for television. It is, in fact, real life. And the allegation of Judy Huff in her lawsuit that Mr. Cosby committed an act of childhood sexual abuse against her is a serious one. 
we look forward to seeing Mr. Cosby on October 9th, 2015. And now I'd like to introduce Elizabeth. And you have a photograph of her at or about the time that she was a flight attendant. And as I said, had the misfortune to meet Mr. Cosby. Based in New York City. Daughter? Daughter. I was a flight attendant for American Airlines based in New York City, and it was the summer of 1976. I was barely 10 years old. It was my dream. Being a flight attendant in the 70s was actually somewhat glamorous and prestigious, or at least I thought it was. I hadn't been flying for just a few months. I was on call every other month. I received a call for flight number one. It was the most senior flight American Airlines flew out of New York City. It left LaGuardia around 7 a.m. and was a non-stop to Los Angeles. I seem to remember it getting in L.A. around 10. The ticket agent said there was a celebrity on board. It was their policy to always notify the crew. I was from a small town in Illinois, some thousand people. So I thought meeting a celebrity was extremely exciting. We were informed it was Mr. Bill Cosby, and he was very popular at that time with his jello ads. I was working in coach, and he was in first class. I was so thrilled to get his autograph because I knew no one would ever believe that I met a celebrity after a few months of flying. So I asked the first flight attendant if she could get a plane. She said that he flew that flight a lot and spent most of the trip. But he would let me know, she would let me know when he woke up. She rang me and I went to introduce myself. He was receptive to the autograph and said he would come back to coach to chat with us. He was very funny and spent about an hour talking with the three of us coach flight attendants. I thanked him for his autograph. He wanted to know what I was doing while I was in LA. I told him I had plans. He insisted I take his number. He invited me to the Playboy Mansion to lay out in the sun while he played tennis with James Brown. I thanked him, but he declined. I thanked him, but I declined. He asked where I was staying because he said his driver could drop me off, but I chose to ride the airline they had to the hotel. When he returned to first class, the other flight attendant said, I was stupid not to go. They all said they would have accepted it in a minute. I said I was too scared, and they told me I was just being silly. It was Bill Cosby. What would happen? <laughs> My plans actually fell through, and Bill called the hotel and rang the room. I told him I was reluctant, but he assured me his driver would pick me up and take me back when I wanted to go. It seemed harmless, so I agreed. His driver in a black Rolls Royce arrived promptly at 11. It was around 11.30 when I got to the mansion. Everyone was still sleeping. It was in the air when Hugh Hefner was dating Barbie Benton. The doorman showed me the bathing room dressing area. It was a cave-like dressing area. There were bikinis and robes of every color and style, and the yard was like a garden of Eden. I had never seen anything so beautiful. No one was at the pool until a gentleman took the lounge next to me. He introduced himself as Peter Lawford. And I asked if he asked me if he would like to order lunch for us. In 1976, the thought of a phone by a pool and ordering a steak lunch was something I do, my friends would believe. And they didn't. After pause, which is what he wanted to call him was finished playing tennis and he came to the pool and asked me to dinner. He said his driver will take me back to my hotel fresh enough and pick me up around six or seven. I agree. So far the day has been fabulous and Mr. Cosby has been a gentleman. I was an attractive young woman but I never thought for one minute this was anything but a nice gesture. I knew he was married and I just assumed he enjoyed the company. Yes, I was married. We went to a restaurant called the Tokyo Kaiken. Paz had told me he was staying at the Beverly Hilton. He arrived at the restaurant before me. 
I did not drink or use drugs. But he insisted I drink the sake. It was already poured for me. I sipped it, but it was too sweet. He insisted I drink it and mix it up. He ordered then a few special appetizers. He was getting a lot of attention from the owner and chef, and therefore I could tell he had frequented the restaurant. There was a couple that wanted his autograph, but he told the owner he did not want to be bothered. He ordered a house specialty, which was Land's eyeballs, and I will never forget it, a whole plate of eyeballs looking at me. I was feeling really lightheaded from the sake, so I was afraid to eat them because I didn't want to get sick. I do remember eating some of them, and after that I was completely in a trance-like state. It was like I was dreaming. It was like if you had been under anesthesia and you were just coming out of that state. I don't know how yeah, I don't I don't know how we got to the hotel. He went into the bathroom, undressed, and came out in the road. I told him I needed to go back to the hotel. I could barely stand up, and I was either going to pass out or get really very sick. He made me kneel down, and I'm not I'm not going to repeat what happened next. All I know is that it was the most horrifying thing that could happen to any young woman. And I thought it was the next thing I remember is I was in Rolls Royce profusely vomiting. I apologized and the director said I wasn't the first. I remember seeing a aunt where she in the back window I was. I was so drugged and sick that the driver had to escort me to my room. I woke up fully clothed, like I hadn't moved all night, and I was sicker than I'd ever been in my life. I got dressed and made it to the airport, but I told the crew I had a terrible case of the flu. The captain made me take oxygen in the cockpit for seven flight legs back to New York because I was so ill. The next day, Bill Paul, and he wanted to fly me to Monaco to meet him. He told me he wanted to get a place for me in New York where he could see me. I told him it wasn't the one that made me sick and you know it. He sent me three dozen roses. I told him to never call again. He tried to call several more times. He finally stopped after my repeated refusals. Here I am, 38 years later, finally telling my story. No one would have ever believed me in 1976. I would have been told I put myself in a vulnerable situation and it was my fault. I've lived with this shame and this guilt of thinking it was somehow my fault, but it wasn't. Because if I hadn't been drugged, I would have never ended up in a hotel room with, with him, ever, and he knew that.
of up to, I'm saying, the days, the days were long, and it was a dream of a lifetime to be on the set with great performers of that day. I still remember to this day the excitement of everyone there. It was a time when a number of black movies were being produced in Hollywood. As a young woman trying to make my way in the world, I had no clue about how the real world worked. It was the 70s, it was a time of black power, black is beautiful, peace movement, folk festivals, sit-ins, flower children, transcendental meditation, black panthers, jazz, folk music, rock and roll, and a sexual revolution. While working on the set of Uptown Saturday Night as an extra, I met Mr. Cosby. One day he invited a few of us to come and hear him play. He would often hold late night jam sessions at a local club, concerts by the sea in Madonna Beach. I only attended one late, one late night jam session. We met at the jazz club and listened to music. He was on the stage playing when the band, and they, they played later to the night. It had been a long day and he joined us. We all had dinner and drinks. As the evening was coming to a close, Mr. Cosby continued the evening and asked us to go to the Playboy Mansion. I had never been to the Playboy Mansion, so I asked one of the girls that had been working with me if she was going, and she said yes. We all went there, and we had a late night meal and drinks in the dining room at the mansion. Hugh Hefner came in and said hello, but he did not stay. Mr. Cosby was our host. We ate and drank. I became ill. I vaguely remember coming back from the bathroom. The next thing I remember was sort of a, I was sort of awake in a bed with no clothes, and there was Mr. Cosby in a row, crawling from the bottom of the bed. I was incapacitated and couldn't say no. He engaged in sexual activity with me. It was not consensual. I was afraid to call out. He left. I didn't know where I was. My only thought was I had to get dressed and get out of here. I found my clothes. I got out of the room. I'm not sure how I got out, but he took me to my car. I did see Mr. Cosby on the set again. He looked through me. I was afraid to say anything. I buried it deep in my soul until now. I did not say anything to anyone. Who would believe me? I have worked and tried to live my life. When I heard the other women, I said, oh my God, that is what happened to me. I couldn't believe it. I had to search my mind over and over. I replayed it over and over, because I don't take this lightly. It took me this long to say something because the, the burden of saying something has a huge effect on a lot of lives and on mine as well.
since I was also an aspiring actress at the time. He paid for my flight and arranged for a driver to pick me up and take me to the airport and then to his home in Massachusetts. After a celebrity studied Christmas Eve dinner at his home with his wife Camille and children and many guests, he later approached me while I was alone in the guest house. He wrapped his arms around me and then roughly grabbed me, grabbed my hair, and proceeded to aggressively kiss me and grope my breast and other parts of my body. I tried to fend him off and said, stop, get off me, your family is here. But he ignored my pleas until I began to get louder. Then he stopped. He had a look on his face like he did nothing wrong, but he was like an animal that preyed on me and caught me out of the sight of his wife and children. For the rest of that night, I tried to be invisible. I was so ashamed and humiliated. I had to endure a painful night's stay at his home until I could get a flight out in the morning. I trusted Bill Cosby and looked up to him, and I never would have imagined that he would invite me to his home in Massachusetts on Christmas Eve to assault me. That night, I could have been home, I could have been safe at home enjoying Christmas Eve with my own family. Bill Cosby continued to pursue me after that incident as if nothing had happened. He offered me a role in his upcoming film my mentor and to pay my tuition to acting school. I told him I was not interested in him or anything he was selling. I decided to tell no one about this shameful incident and have kept it a secret until I too came forward in November 2014. Previously, of course, challenged and invited Mr. Cosby 
to agree not to assert the statute of limitations in a lawsuit to invite all of the accused to sue him and let's let judge and jury decide. I communicated that to his attorneys as well. Mr. Cosby has not accepted that challenge. He rejected it. Also, as to criminal prosecution, it's too late also for them to have a prosecution proceed if, in fact, the DA found believe that based on the evidence that they had, that the case could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, even then it's too late because of the time period which, is, which has expired for criminal prosecution. So that, of all of the ones that I represent, which now I think is about, I don't know, 25, something like that, I have one lawsuit at this time. Yes. So of the women that may still yet come forward, can any of them hold out the possibility of the election? I couldn't hear the last part of that. Do so the women... Are there any, you know, you said there are women that still come forward, there are still contacting still you. Still me, you're in yes, and I welcome anyone who has not yet spoken out, who wishes to speak it out, we have to contact me, and then I'm happy to review the allegations, and then we'll have to But say. do any of them... Um, you know, is, is legal action possible for them? Are they like you up and they go forward with legal action? Do you think? Now, I really can't make any prediction about what's going to happen in the future. Whether I will be representing more than one person in a lawsuit, uh, I wouldn't have any comment on that at this time, nor will I make a prediction. Can I ask again? Yes. Uh, also, I have many people contacting me who just want to provide information to help, but who will never come forward. And then there's another group who are contacting me who will never come forward, want me to have the information, and are willing to testify if they are subpoenaed and permitted to testify. Yes? Um, Hugh Hafner seems to be a common denominator in many of these accusers' stories. Have you spoken to him? about you know what might have been happening at the Playboy Mansion. Is he willing to speak and will you depose him? I know Hugh Hefner, I've known him for many decades. I have not spoken to him for some time. And when I did speak with him, which was some time ago, I think it, it was definitely, I, I believe, before the recent allegations beginning in November. I think that I saw him before that. I think it was last year. I'm not positive. Um, I, no, I did not speak to him about this, nor would I speak to him about this at this time. Would he be testifying in the future? I don't know. Yes? Is there anything more you can tell us about the scope of the direction of the question? I'm sure that it might be better. Uh, I'm not at liberty to preview questions. I'm not at liberty to preview evidence. All I can do is reiterate that in any deposition, we have wide latitude in the questions that we can ask as lawyers in a civil case. We can ask any question that is relevant and that might tend to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. We have wider latitude in a deposition to ask questions than we would in a trial in a court of law, where we would be more restricted. Do you want to be back to ask the question uh, relating to all of the more important now? We will ask any question and every question that will fit that legal standard that I just articulated, and then we'll see what the answers are. We'll see whether he will be permitted to answer by his attorneys, and we'll see whether, if there is a dispute as to what he may answer or what he may not answer, then that is likely to be resolved by the court. 
time I can't tell you whether it will be resolved during the deposition or after the deposition or even before the deposition as to questions that he must answer. is where is the deposition going to take place and how likely is it that he's going to show up. At this time, I'm not disclosing the location of the deposition. However, we have noticed his deposition, meaning that we have provided notice to his attorneys of the time, place, and specific location of the deposition. As to whether he will show up, His attorneys have assured me that he will be showing up. And so that is my expectation, that I'll accept their representation. That's all I can say at this time. Yes, sir. How confident are you that Mr. Poppy will answer to the deposition? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing your question. How confident are you that he's going to talk to you about truthful issues in this deposition and do you anticipate he'll cooperate? The question is, how confident am I that Mr. Cosby will be truthful during the deposition and that he will cooperate? Correct? Okay. Well, I always have an expectation that any, any deponent, anyone who is being deposed, will be truthful because that is their duty under the law is to give truthful testimony. So that is my expectation of Mr. Cosby. I only have control over our questions. He has control over his answers. And that's all I can say at this point about his answers. Any further? Yes, sir. Has uh, Monique Presley uh, responded to the challenge that you put to her last week to debate publicly? Thank you for asking. The question is, has Monique Presley, who is one of Mr. Cosby's attorneys, and who is the one who is apparently the public face of his legal team, who has been on CNN, I think MSNBC, various radio shows, and perhaps other platforms, and has been speaking out in defense of Mr. Cosby, unaccompanied by a, anyone from our legal team, just being asked questions by a reporter. I challenged her in a previous news conference to debate with me. In other words, that I would be on the same platform as she is and that we could have a debate. And she has not accepted my challenge. I'm paraphrasing what she said in a written statement which she has provided to the press. I'm sure she provided to you if you asked for it. Something to the effect of we are attorneys and attorneys do this in the court of law that she doesn't want to engage in a public spectacle. Well, I, I really am a little bit mystified, but that answer because obviously, if she's on CNN, if she's on MSNBC, if she's on the radio, if she's being questioned by reporters, last time I checked, that was not a court law. And so, why she will not accept my challenge to debate, I guess everyone has to draw their own conclusions. I'm not afraid, if she's not, and so far that hasn't happened. What has happened to my experience is if I'm on a radio show, for example, I know that she then contacted the producer of that show and then asked to come on at the same amount of time after. So any and all of you, I issue this invitation. She is willing still to change her mind or if the team allows her to change her mind or if her client allows her to change her mind and come on and debate me on what she is saying I'll be there. And I think that is the best way in the court of public opinion. I might add 
Of course, I'm willing to debate everything except the case I'm litigating because that is going to be decided in a court of law. But as to all the other accusations by all of the other accusers that I represent, who will not be able to be in a court of law unless and until and if they are seated in a lawsuit as a witness, but not for their own case. They're never going to have an ability to be in a court of law, so they are in the court of public opinion. That's where she is. That's where I am as to the other accusers. Let's have a debate there. Apparently, they're not willing to do that. And only they can explain why. Why it's not a public spectacle when she's out there answering questions. But a debate would be, I don't know. Wait, she'll just have to respond accordingly. And I'd be looking forward to that debate. Debate, for example, about her statements that women need to take responsibility. Yeah, well, they're taking responsibility. But they're not taking responsibility for what was done to them, what they alleged was done to them. Because they didn't do this to themselves. Anything else? Yes, sir. Do you plan to call the other accusers in the school's case? Pardon me? Do you plan to call other accusers? Do I plan to call other accusers in Judy Huff's case? At this point, uh, we are not going to be commenting on our strategy. Don't know what Mr. Cosby's attorneys have planned for that, but we'll have to see. Anything further? Yes, ma'am. Um, what was the police report mentioned in the deposition that was released of, of Barry Cosby? I, could you speak up a little, please? Sure. The 2005-2006 uh, the deposition of Bill Cosby that was released? Yes. Um, in it, there is a case that is mentioned. Um, it was a, a, a 911 call put into the Cheltenham police um, alleging of a, a man made on Valentine's Day 2004 alleging that his wife had been raped by Cosby in Vegas. Um, he didn't want to give his name or her name. Do you know if that's one of your clients? I don't have access to the full 2005 deposition from the Andrea Constant lawsuit because the court has not released the formally released the full deposition. The court has only released excerpts of that deposition that were attached to Andrea Constant's motion for sanctions. I do know the New York Times has obtained the full deposition on behalf of two other of my clients, two Jane Doe's, from that 2005 lawsuit. I have asked my co-counsel in Pennsylvania to file, and she has in that case, in support of Andrea's request to have all of the documents released. In other words, to have that full deposition released. Unless and until it is released, I don't have access to it. It's a long way of saying I don't have, I haven't read that particular line, which you allege is in the deposition, because that was not attached to the motion for sanctions. So sorry, I can't comment on that. Except to say, I certainly have a great interest in the whole deposition because I represent two women who were Jane Doe's at the time who were mentioned by Mr. Cosby in that deposition. They were mentioned in the excerpts, for example, Beth Ferrier, Jane Doe number five, where he admits that he knew that Beth Ferrier passed a lie detector test about him. He knew he had been read the story that she had given to the National Enquirer, that the National Enquirer was considering publishing, and that he, he killed the story that by, by telling the National Enquirer, asserting that if they would not publish Beth's story, that he would give them an exclusive, which he did. As to my other client, uh, Ms. Neal, he says he doesn't recall her. She, of course, cannot imagine how that could be. She saw him on more than one occasion. That's a subject for another time. Yes? We've heard that the Los Angeles Police Department is currently uh, investigating both the heavy uh, people who are representing the contacted as part of that investigation. 
question has to do with the investigation by the Los Angeles Police Department. Have I been contacted by them? No. I did originally take my client, Judy Huck, to the Los Angeles Police Department to be interviewed because the day prior to the day that I took her there, Los Angeles Police Chief Charlie Beck had made a public statement and invited anyone who alleged or believed that she might have been a victim of a crime in the Los Angeles area, paraphrasing with that suppose, to please come in and speak to his detectives, even if it might be too late to have the alleged perpetrator prosecuted. And so based on that invitation, I accepted it, brought in Judy Huff, spent 45 minutes with two detectives from the Special Victims Unit who interviewed Ms. Huff. Some weeks later, the District Attorney of Los Angeles County announced it was too late to criminally prosecute him. Well, we knew that when we took her in, but we went in at the invitation of the chief. What's the significance of that? Well, the significance of that is as to any allegations by Ms. Huff, any invocation of the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, you know, would be something that some might question, since he cannot be criminally prosecuted. So the DA has said, has indicated, he cannot, will not be prosecuted criminally for any allegations that Ms. Huff. One last thing on that. Her statement was not an indication of any conclusion that she had about the merits of what Ms. Huff had alleged. Not a statement about whether the DA thought she could prove it beyond a reasonable doubt or not, but simply a statement that it was too late given the statute of limitations for criminal prosecution in California. Which, by the way, we're going to be engaged in an effort to change the statute of limitations. Do it will be retroactive. Anyway, any last questions? Okay, uh, so this is. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. All right. Elizabeth is indicating that what she alleges happened with Mr. Cosby happened roughly two months after this photo was taken. And this photo of you as a flight attendant, right? when she was graduated from flight college. That photo was taken. This is one of, here we go, Sarita. One of the photos of Sarita. There's another one of uh, Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have a photo of Charlotte, but I'm sure she was beautiful and still is. So. All right, so, okay. Thank you very much for coming.